Speaker of the Canadian Parliament, the longest serving Speaker in his country's history, Peter Millican. Welcome, Peter, to the House of Commons. Uh, Mr. Paul Scully. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can my right honourable friend confirm that recent figures show that last year almost £200 million of taxpayers' money was spent on trade union activists? Wouldn't Transport London, for London, for example, be better advised to spend the £5 million that it, it spent on trade union activities on Transport for London? Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Whilst trade unions, of course, play an important role in the modern workplace, facility time within the public sector must represent value for money. That's why we have taken a transparent approach to it. We estimate that over £120 million is being spent on this. Departments and government agencies must seek to reduce this spending, as I'm pleased to say the Cabinet Office has done, but we are spending less than 0.01% of our budget on this. Julie Elliott. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister tell the House what steps he is taking to tackle the gender pay gap in the civil service? Minister. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, the Government uh, has required all public bodies and large private sector employers to make public the gender pay gap so that action can then be taken to ensure that that gap is reduced and closed. And we are determined that the public sector will be setting an example. Would. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can my right honourable friend confirm that thanks to his efforts and those of the Department of Health and Sandwell and West Birmingham NHS Trust, work on the Midland Metropolitan Hospital will resume later this year after the collapse of Carillion, and the West Midlands will get another world-class hospital? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Mr Speaker, I am pleased to confirm that the Government and the Local Trust have reached agreement that the Midland Metropolitan Hospital will be completed by 2022. It will be equipped with state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment, 15 operating theatres and at least 669 new beds. This is further demonstration of this Government's commitment to investment in our National Health Service. Since 2010, the Central Civil Service has been cut by 20%, severely reducing overall effectiveness and specialist knowledge. In light of the demands placed on the departments by Brexit, does the Government not agree that they are paying the price of this short-sightedness? The Government remains strongly committed to having an effective civil service. In respect of Brexit, thanks to funds provided by this Government, we now employ 7,000 more civil servants to deal with it. And in uh, the pay settlements that we are reaching on a department by department basis, we are ensuring that civil servants are properly rewarded. First glove. Mr. Speaker, the ministers were right to listen and act on the issue of public sector procurement of steel. How are those new procurement regulations bedding down, and what effect and what benefit are they bringing to the UK steel industry? Minister Dowden. Well, as I've said, we are very clear we'll do everything we can, we can to support our precious steel industry. All central government departments are now required to evaluate social and economic benefits in procurement decisions alongside price. This has meant that the UK steel producers are now in the best possible position to compete for government work, and UK steel suppliers are able to compete effectively with international suppliers. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. David Dukit. Yeah. Question number one, Mr. Yeah. Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure members across the House will wish to join me in congratulating Alistair Cook on his fantastic yeah. service to his cricket. As England's highest ever scoring batsman, his incredible career had many highlights, including the magnificent 147 in his last innings against India, and we wish him the very best for his future. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. David Dukit. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I know that the Prime Minister appreciates the significance of fishing communities around the UK, not least my own constituency of Banff and Buchan. What steps will my honourable friend take to support our fishing communities during the implementation period, and will she look at ways to support the expansion of the catching fleet, infrastructure, processing capacity and other businesses reliant on the sector. 
Prime Prime Minister. Minister. Friend, that I fully recognise the importance of the fishing industry to his and to other constituencies represented in this House. And I can reassure him that what we want to do is to secure a sustainable and profitable fishing industry that will regenerate coastal communities and will support future generations of UK fishermen. Uh, what we can do when we leave the EU, it means taking back control of our waters, setting our own fisheries rules and exclusively determining who fishes what in our seas. And it's a priority of this government also to make sure we have an innovative, productive and competitive food supply chain and work to consider the long-term future of all funding programmes that are currently managed by the EU is underway. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too join the Prime Minister in congratulating Alistair Cook on a fantastic achievement and both teams on what has been an absolutely brilliant series, which I really enjoyed. Mr Speaker... The National Farmers Union, the Federation of Small Businesses, the National Audit Office, the National Housing Federation, Gingerbread and the Royal Society of Arts. Does the Prime Minister know what these organisations have in common? gentlemen that what those organisations all have in common is that across a variety of areas of activity they give excellent service, they promote the interests of those that they represent and they are bodies with which this government interacts and to which this government listens. I am truly grateful to the Prime Minister for that answer, the first part of which I wholly agree. But what they also have... It's all right. It's all right. But what they also have in common, Mr Speaker, is that they're telling this government its flagship benefits policy, universal credit, is flawed and failing hundreds of thousands of people, both in work and out of work. In 2010, the government declared that universal credit would lift... 350,000 children out of poverty. Does the Prime Minister stand by that figure? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we introduced universal credit because we needed a system of welfare in this country which encouraged people into work rather than discouraged them into work. Which made, sure, which made sure that work always pays, and that was a simpler system than the legacy system that we were left by the Labour Party. Remember, remember the legacy system of the Labour Party? It meant that we even had individuals being paid £100,000 a year on benefits, all paid for by hard-working taxpayers earning a fraction of that sum. Mr Speaker, the Child Poverty Action Group says that far from taking children out of poverty, universal credit will now increase the number of children in poverty. And since 2010, half a million more children have gone into poverty relative to that time. The Government knows this policy is flawed and failing. Their own survey on universal credit found many were in debt, a third in arrears with their rent, half fallen behind with their bills. Does the Prime Minister dispute her own government survey or dispute the experience of the claimants? Prime Minister, the experience of some of the claimants. Roberta, who said, my work coach helped turn my life around. He tailored his support to my situation and thanks to him I found my dream job. Ryan, I'm happy with the new universal credit. My work coach has been great. I didn't expect to have a job so soon. Naeem, universal credit gave me the flexibility to take on additional hours without the stress of thinking this might stop my benefits straight away. We have gone from a situation under the Labour Party where 1.4 million people 1.4 1.4 million people spent most of a decade trapped on benefits. We are helping get people into work, and that's why earlier this week we saw unemployment yet again at a record low. Yeah. 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 Mr. 
Mr Speaker, we are all, we are all constituency MPs and I think most of us are well aware of the pain that universal credit is causing when people come into our advice bureaus. 60% of families facing cuts due to the two-child policy are in work. Yes. Universal credit isn't making work pay. It's taking money away from families and putting more children into poverty. The National Audit Office report found that universal credit is creating hardship, forcing people to use food banks and could actually end up costing the system even more. Yes. Does the Prime Minister dispute the National Audit Office findings? Prime Minister. The right honourable gentleman talked about constituency cases. I remember, I remember. Order. We're at a very early stage of the proceedings. We've got a long way to go. The questions must be heard and the answers must be heard. And as usual, I want to get through the order paper. The Prime Minister. The right honourable gentleman started his question by talking about constituency cases. I remember the single mother who came to see me as her Member of Parliament when Labour were in government, who told me that she wanted to get into the workplace and provide a good example to her child, but the job centre had told her she'd be better off on benefits. That's the legacy of the Labour Party. Mr Speaker, my question was about the National Audit Office. The Trussell Trust backs the NAO. They say that food bank usage in areas where universal credit has been rolled out is four times higher in areas than in areas where it has not been introduced. But without resolving any of those failings in the next year, the Government proposes to inflict this on another two million people. Yeah. As part of that transfer, hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities on ESA, JSA and tax credits will receive a letter telling them their support will be stopped. They will have to make an application for universal credit. Does the Prime Minister think it's the responsibility of the government which is changing the system to ensure people retain the support they need, or is it down to the individual, many of whom are actually very vulnerable people who need help and support? Prime Minister! What the government is doing is delivering a system that does give support to vulnerable people, that encourages people to get into the workplace, because we know that work is the best route out of poverty. But if the right honourable gentleman if the right honourable gentleman believes that universal credit needed some change, then why when we make changes like ensuring that we uh, reduce the waiting days for payment, that we brought in a housing benefit overlap to help people and we on why was it that Labour voted against those changes? Mr Speaker, it's Labour that's been speaking up for the poorest in this country. It's Labour that's been challenging this government. It's Labour that wants a decency within our society that this government is incapable of delivering. Uh, Mr Spencer, I always thought you were a good-natured, laid-back farmer. You seem to be a very over-excitable denizen of the House today. Calm yourself, man. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, the mental health charity Mind says there's a real possibility, and I quote, that many people with mental health problems could see their benefits stopped entirely. It is outrageous that vulnerable people risk losing out because of these botched changes. The government's Brexit negotiations are an abject failure. I can see that by the sullen faces behind her. It's the whole lot of them. But everywhere you look, Mr Speaker, this government is failing. One million families using food banks. A million workers on zero-hours contracts. Four million children in poverty. Wages lower today than ten years ago. And on top of that, there's the flawed and failing universal credit. Disabled people risk losing their homes and vital support. Children forced to use food banks. And the Prime Minister wants to put two million more people onto this. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is not 
is not challenging the burning injustices in our society. She's pouring petrol on the crisis. When will she stop inflicting misery on the people of this country? Minister. The right, the right honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman talks about challenging the burning injustices. Challenging the burning injustices. That's about setting up the racial disparity audit, which says what do public services do and how do people from different communities in our country, uh, how do they, are they treated by our public services? It means saying that nobody in this country should be stopped and searched on our streets because of the colour of their skin. That was me as Home Secretary, never the Labour Party. What we're doing is seeing three point three million more people in jobs as a result of our balanced approach to the economy. And what have we seen from Labour over the past few days? Iranian state TV broadcasting no confidence votes against Labour members of Parliament. Police investigating anonymous and threatening letters about the deselection of Labour MPs sent to Labour offices. And most shamefully, most shamefully of all, and most shamefully of all, the Honourable Member for Streatham saying that the Labour Party is now an institutionally racist party. That's what he's done to Labour. Just think what he'd do to this country. Articulation is required, Mr. Brake. Calm yourself. You're a former deputy leader of the House. Behave in a statesmanlike manner. Let's order. Let's hear the questions and the answers, Mr. Nigel Huddleston. We, uh, we quite rightly spend quite a lot of time in this place talking about crime and criminals and prisons, but perhaps we don't spend enough time talking about the victims of crime. So I warmly welcome the Government's announcement this week of a victim strategy, but can the Prime Minister assure me this will not be some kind of dry document, but a genuine effort to boost support for the victims? Prime Minister. My honourable friend, that assurance, because we know that nothing can take away the trauma and distress of being a victim of crime, but we need to ensure that people get the support they need uh, as they rebuild their lives, and this is absolutely vital. It's our duty to keep people safe, but it's also our duty to ensure uh, that victims are properly protected and listened to, and that's why we're taking steps to enshrine their entitlements in law, to strengthen the Victims' Code, and this first ever cross-government victim strategy will ensure that victims of crime receive the care and support they deserve at every stage of their interaction with the justice system. And I'd like to commend my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, but also my honourable friend, the member for Charnwood, for the work they put into this victim strategy. And Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A decade on from the financial crisis, the poorest in our society are still paying a price. The bankers were bailed out, but ordinary people paid the bill. IFS analysis shows that real wages are on average £800 lower. A decade on, and people are poorer. A damning indictment of the UK Government's leadership. Tell us, Prime Minister, why have you abandoned millions of families, those just about managing? Honourable gentlemen, what we've done is created an economic environment where 3.3 million people are in work. We now see the number of children in workless households at the lowest level ever. We now, we now also see what we have done is we've increased the national living wage. We have ensured that we've taken 4 million people out of paying income tax altogether. Over 30 million people have received a tax cut. That's what this government's been able to do by a balanced approach to the economy. 
keeping, uh, keeping taxes low, putting money into public services and reducing our debt. Yeah. Yeah. Ian Blackford. That, I'm afraid, simply ignores the reality that people are poorer. It's been the worst decade for wage growth in over 200 years. Yeah. Households are struggling, and the No Deal Brexit is reported to increase the annual cost of living for low-income households by hundreds of pounds. Yet this Prime Minister still wants to walk off the Brexit cliff edge. The Prime Minister is unfit to govern. She is incapable of leadership. We know it, her backbenchers know it, and the country knows it. Ten years after the economic crash, and the poorest are still bearing the brunt. Mr Speaker, it's as simple as this. The Prime Minister should end her austerity programme or admit that her party is unfit for government. Can I say to the right hon. Gentleman, he mentions the question of Brexit. And, of course, we are working to get a good Brexit deal for the whole of the United Kingdom, including Scotland. And can I suggest to the right hon. Gentleman that he might listen to the views of the uh, Scottish NFU, who said this week that the plan that the Government has put forward is something that certainly the agriculture and food and drink sectors can work with, and that politicians from all sorts of parliaments and assemblies should actually get behind it. Charles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, the the Clacton constituency is a mere 69 miles from London, as I'm sure my right honourable friend remembers from her visits a few years ago. Uh, And and you're lucky to cover that tiny journey in an hour and 40 minutes, and that's if you avoid the network rail works. Now, our Sunshine Coast has a lot to offer economically, a lot of which remains untapped. We we could attract new homeowners, doctors and businesses to the area. So can my right honourable friend please tell me what this government is doing to improve our rail services and speed up the, the journey to Clacton. Uh, Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to, can I say to my honourable friend, first of all, I do indeed remember the visit that I made to Clacton in 2014, uh, but uh, actually there I was very pleased to meet with Caroline Shearer to hear that the work that she'd done on anti-knife crime, uh, ch- the charity she'd set up in memory of her murdered son, Jay Whiston. But on the issue of rail that my honourable friend has raised, Greater Anglia will indeed be introducing a whole new fleet of trains. Uh, They will be available, delivered from the middle of next year. They will be state of the art, with much improved acceleration, I think my honourable friend will be pleased to to hear. Uh, Now, they need to work with Network Rail to ensure that they can deliver those improved journey times. Uh, And there are infrastructure uh, constraints on the the line. But we we will engage with Network Rail to understand what plans they have to renew the infrastructure so that we can see the improvement on the uh, Clacton branch that my honourable friend wants to see. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has just said that work is the best route out of poverty. Yeah. Now, without, without repeating the response that she just gave to the leader of the SNP, can she explain why, after eight years of a Conservative government, the Living Wage Foundation reports that 40% of people in Grimsby do not earn enough to live on. Yeah. Prime Minister. Can I say to the, uh, the, the Honourable Lady that what the figures show is that the proportion of the, people, of the, the workforce on low pay is actually at its lowest level. This is as a result of the changes that we have introduced, the changes we have made in relation to the economy and the balanced approach, the balanced approach that we have taken. I also say to the Honourable Lady that if she is worried, if she's worried about people living in Grimsby, then the answer is not a Labour government with £500 billion of extra borrowing, fewer jobs, higher taxes and people suffering the cost. John Lamont. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Given what we know about the Russian state's involvement in the Salisbury poisoning, does the Prime Minister think it appropriate that parliamentarians, both current and former, appear in Russian state television? Yeah. Minister... Can I, can I say to the, my hon. Friend that I am sure we all have doubts about the objectivity of the reporting on Russian, Russia today, which does remain a tool of propaganda for the Russian state? Now, decisions about appearing on Russia today is a matter of the judgment for each individual, but they should be clear that they risk being used as propaganda tools by the Russian state. 
and I know that that is a view that is shared by other members of this House, including the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Ross, Skye and Loch Arbour, who has made clear he does not think people should appear on that station. I would also say the same applies to Press TV, whose licence to broadcast has been revoked uh, in the UK by Ofcom. Deirdre Brock. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister refused to answer my written questions about Aggregate IQ visiting Downing Street, so I will ask her here. Why did Jeff Sylvester and Zach Missingham of Aggregate IQ visit number 10 last autumn? Who did they meet? Who invited them? What was the purpose of the meeting? And most importantly, why was the meeting not recorded in the transparency ah. database? Ah. Prime Minister! Can I, say, can I say to the Honourable Lady that her letter has not been drawn to my attention? I do not have. No. But following, following, her question, following her question, I will ensure that she receives a reply in writing. Phil! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Brexit, the joint statement of the 8th of December last year said that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Does the Prime Minister agree that this means uh, the payment of the £39 billion uh, exit payment and the Northern Irish backstop are dependent on agreeing satisfactory final state trade arrangements? And does she also agree that payment of that money uh, should be locked into the legally binding uh, withdrawal agreement that also requires those final state trade agreements to be fully agreed and implemented uh, by the 31st of December 2020 in a form acceptable to this House? I say Prime Minister. That we are very clear that we need to have a link between the future relationship and the withdrawal agreement. But we are a country that honours our obligations. We believe in the rule of law and therefore we believe in abiding by our legal obligations. However, my honourable friend is right that the specific offer was made in the spirit of our desire to reach a deal with the European Union and on the basis, as the EU themselves have said, that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Without a deal, the position changes. Paul Blomfield. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister was right yesterday to be promoting electric vehicles But she also needs to focus on electricity production. Investment in renewable energy has halved as a result of government's policies. And instead of encouraging carbon-emitting technologies like fracking, which is deeply unpopular in Sheffield and across the country, will she recognise our future depends on serious investment in wind, solar, tidal and other renewables? The Honourable Gentleman, that I believe that in the terms of the uh, provision of energy across the United Kingdom, we need to have a diverse uh, a range of supplies. That's why, yes, we do and have supported and continue to support renewable energy, but it's also why, it's also why we're ensuring, for example, that we have a supply of energy in the future from nuclear uh, and that we look across other forms of energy uh, as well, in terms of uh, also, for example, uh, ensuring that we see an increase in the number of interconnectors. With, uh, with Europe. So a diverse supply is what we need in our energy sector. Alan Mack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Young Claude Juncker this morning accepted that Britain will always be a close trade and security partner for the EU. Does my right honourable friend agree that this means that giving Britain a good deal is in the interests of both sides? Yeah. Prime Minister. I've always, I've always said uh, to this House that I believe a deal that's right for the UK will be a deal that's right for the European Union. But I, I note uh, not only that President Juncker said what my honourable friend has, has uh, commented on, he also went on to say, after the 29th of March 2019, the United Kingdom will never be an ordinary third country for us. I welcome Prime Minister May's proposal to develop an ambitious new partnership for the future after Brexit. We agree with the statement made in Chequers that the starting point for such a partnership should be a free trade area between the United Kingdom and the European Union. So let me be very clear, when we leave the European Union, we will be an independent sovereign state. We will have control of our money, our borders and our laws. But I want to say to our closest allies in Europe, you will never, also never, be an ordinary third party for us. Yeah. Justin Madders. Thank yeah, you, yeah, Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is huge concern over proposals to take decisions on fracking away from local councils, a concern seemingly shared by a prominent Conservative MP who has a number of st- statements on her website, including local planning decisions should be returned to locally elected councillors, and local power- councils need the power to stop unsuitable developments. The Prime Minister will hopefully 
recognise these comments. She made them. Does she still agree with them? Yeah. <laughs> Prime Minister! It has, it has always been the case across the planning uh, uh, structure that we have here in the United Kingdom that there are decisions that are taken at local level, but there are also decisions, and sometimes those decisions at local level are referred on to uh, a national level. Yeah. Order. Closed question, Mr Michael Fabricant. Question 12, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. I was indeed very pleased to be in the West Midlands yesterday at the world's first zero emissions vehicle summit where I made clear my determination to put our manufacturers in the West Midlands and across the UK at the forefront of the design and manufacturing of zero emission vehicles. The Midlands has a very strong automotive industry. The growth of high-tech manufacturing across the region continues to drive investment. It's creating high school jobs. It's boosting economic growth. And the latest employment statistics released yesterday show there are now over 320,000 more people in work in the West Midlands than in 2010. Michael Fabrican. I thank my right honourable friend for that answer. Also based in the West Midlands is Silicon Canal. Silicon Canal is like Silicon Valley, but without the sunshine. It employs some 40,000 people working in computer science and some 6,000 different companies, the second largest cluster of its kind in the whole of Europe. So, with the announcement last week, Mr Speaker, of 5G being based in West Midlands as a testbed, what more can the Prime Minister do to promote high-tech in the West Midlands? Mr. Well, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for highlighting the Silicon Canal? I'm sure that, uh, like me, he was delighted that the West Midlands bid, which was pulled together by the Conservative Metro Mayor Andy Street, was chosen was chosen as the winning location of the Urban Connected Communities Project, and as my honourable friend has referred to, this will see the development of a large-scale 5G pilot across uh, the region. But DCMS are also working closely with the West Midlands Combined Authority to develop and deliver a region-wide digital skills partnership, which will bring together key sectors in the region working on improving the digital skills of individuals, of small businesses and of charities, and uh, ensuring strong government engagement and support for these uh, sectors will be critical to the success of the government's industrial strategy. Ben Lake. Yeah. 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 The Secretary of State for Education announced a pay award for teachers recently, which, as the Prime Minister will know, is not yet a devolved responsibility. Now, the government has outlined how it will fund the award for teachers in England, but as yet has not done so for Wales. So will the Prime Minister intervene to put right this oversight and ensure that Welsh teachers and Welsh pupils are not the ones left to foot the bill? Yeah. Or can I say to reassure the honourable gentleman that the uh, Treasury will be setting that out shortly? Yeah. Yeah. Sir Hugo Swire. Mr. Speaker, uh, back in July, in Prime Minister's questions, uh, when I pressed the Prime Minister on the possible publication <coughs> of Sir Alex Allen's report into the Windrush affair, uh, she confirmed that the Home Secretary at the time was considering publication very carefully. Uh, two months later, uh, nothing has come uh, from the Home Secretary or the Home Office. So could she, as Prime Minister, in the interests of transparency and accountability, which I know she believes in, now personally authorise the publication of this long-awaited report? Can I, can I Minister? Uh, reassure my, uh, my on- right honourable friend that uh, the Home Secretary it has been looking at this issue. The Cabinet Secretary is looking at this. Uh, we are uh, committed to uh, making a publication, uh, but the form of that is currently being considered. Uh, Mr Pat McFadden. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Probation issued a devastating report on its findings relating to the murder two years ago of my constituent Lisa Skidmore. The report sets out catastrophic failures on the part of the probation service to act on warnings about the behaviour of her killer, Leroy Campbell, a lifelong violent sex offender, and concludes that Lisa's murder was entirely preventable. Lisa Skidmore was a young woman with her whole life in front of her. Her family had been left completely heartbroken by her loss. She was let down in the most appalling way by a service which is there to monitor offenders and to protect the public, and in this case failed to do so with the most devastating consequences. Can I ask the Prime Minister, what can she and the Ministry of Justice do in response to this report to prevent something like this? happening again. Can I, can I Minister. say to the gentleman that he has raised what was an absolutely devastating 
uh, case. It was a horrific crime and devastating for Lisa's family. And uh, I understand that my honourable friend, the prisons minister, has met the family of Lisa Skidmore, has apologised for the failings in this case. But as uh, the honourable gentleman says, this should not have happened. I understand some action has already been taken, that two members of the probation service have been suspended, uh, but while nothing can be done to bring back Lisa or to minimise the impact that this has had on her family, uh, Dame Glenys Stacey has been asked to conduct an independent review to look at what can be done to prevent such tragedies from happening again, to do as the Honourable Gentleman has said, to make sure that this never happens to anybody else. Trudy Harrison. In the Lake District is one of the most beautiful parts of the UK. And our farmers play such a unique role in maintaining the landscape. On Back British Farming Day, can my right honourable friend ensure that our Cumbrian farmers will be able to export their meat, their world class meat, after we leave the European Union? Minister! Can I, can I say? Can I say to my honourable friend, she is absolutely right to uh, recognise the, the beauty of the area that she represents, of Cumbria and the Lake District, and the important role that farmers play in, the, in that part of the country, as indeed our farmers do elsewhere. When we leave the European Union, we are looking to ensure that we have trade deals that do uh, enable our farmers uh, to continue to be able to export their very, uh, very important product, which is enjoyed by people elsewhere. But we are able, by leaving the European Union, to do something else, which is come out of the common agricultural policy and actually develop a policy for farming in this country, which is right for our farmers and not for others. Wayne David. Mr Speaker, last year 183 people were returned to this country to face justice because of a European arrest warrant. If we leave the EU without a deal, the European arrest warrant will not be available to us. Would the Prime Minister be happy with that? Yeah. Well, the, Prime the Minister Honourable will know full well that as Home Secretary I stood at this dispatch box and uh, led a debate in which we ensured that when we exercised on uh, the powers available under Protocol 36, we actually went back into the European Arrest Warrant. Uh, the European Arrest Warrant is one of those uh, instruments which we have identified in our Chequers Plan as one that we wish to discuss with the European Union with a view to being able to continue to use it. Chris Green. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leah Aldridge was killed by a father in 2002, and after the coroner and Greater Manchester Police finished their investigation, the body was returned to the family for the funeral. Last year, the police discovered that they had retained some of Leah's body parts, and these were returned to the family for a second funeral. Only a few weeks ago, yet more body parts were discovered by the police, and the family had to go through the ordeal of a third funeral. They have no confidence in Greater Manchester Police or the Police and Crime Commissioner, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, that they now have finally allowed the family to lay their daughter, Leah, to rest. Would the Prime Minister hold an inquiry into this matter for the sake of Leah's family and for other families across Greater Manchester? Prime Minister. I say to my honourable friend, I, I think this is an absolutely terrible case that he has set out, and we, I'm sure as he will have felt from the reaction for members, from members across the House when they heard him setting out the details, that we all want to express our deepest sympathy to Leah's family for what is a, a prolonged trauma that they've had to endure as a, way, as a result of the way that this has been handled. I understand the Deputy Mayor of Greater Manchester has been in touch with the Human Tissue Authority about the case, and the Human Tissue Authority are, are advising uh, on ensuring that the, the establishment concerned take the necessary work to evaluate what went wrong in this case, put in measures to minimise the chance that this can ever happen again. And officials in the Home Office are going to be meeting both with the Greater Manchester Police and the National Police Chief's Council to further address this issue of historically held uh, human tissue, and I'll ensure uh, uh, that the relevant Home Office Minister updates my honourable friend on the outcome of those meetings. Harold Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Windrush scandal continues to affect my constituent, who, despite receiving his British passport, has been told he is ineligible for ESA as he has not made enough national insurance contributions over the last two years, an impossible task since he has been prevented from working by the Home Office. 
So will the Prime Minister take responsibility for ensuring the DWP has special measures in place to deal with Windrush applicants, and can she confirm that my constituent will now get the support he deserves? To the Honourable Lady, the Home Office, of course, set up a special task force to deal with uh, the Windrush cases to provide help and support to the individuals. And yes, I know that the Shadow Foreign Secretary is mentioning DWP. I'm coming to come on to the DW. I'm coming on to the DWP. The DWP. I think what is important for the, the uh, individuals concerned mm. is that they are able to interact with one government body that is then able to give yeah. them support and take on the issues for them. So I believe that they should go, he should, the individual concerned should get in touch with the uh, task force and the Home Secretary will make sure that the necessary inquiries are made. Jack Lepresti. Thank, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister visit my constituency to open our this new wing integration centre in Filton, which is a £40 million investment which will secure hundreds of jobs and good quality apprenticeships for the future. And will she join me in thanking and paying tribute to Airbus for their strong and enduring commitment to the UK? Yeah. 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 Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend that he's issued a very interesting invitation? I can't give him an instant response from the dispatch box on it uh, uh, because of uh, need to look at diary commitments. But can I also say to him it's absolutely right uh, that we uh, thank and uh, uh, congratulate Airbus on the commitment they've made to the United Kingdom, on the high quality jobs that they provide here in the UK. And uh, when I went to the Farnborough Air Show, I was very pleased to actually meet with executives from Airbus to look and talk about some of their latest products. Liz Savile Roberts. Yeah. Yeah. In a meeting on Monday, the aluminium and steel industry told leaders of opposition parties, with the exception of the, la- the leader of the Labour Party who refused to attend, that thousands of jobs are to be put at risk by the British Government's Brexit policies and threadbare industrial strategy. Is it not the case that she is prepared to dole out P 45s to manufacturing workers? simply in order to appease the Brexit extremists in her own party. Yeah. Prime Minister! Uh, nothing, uh, her portrayal of the situation couldn't be further from the, uh, from the case. What we have put forward in the Chequers plan is a plan that delivers on the result of the referendum, ensures that we take control of our money, our borders and laws, but does so in a way that protects jobs and livelihood that does so in a way that protects jobs and livelihoods across the United Kingdom. Government has given support to the steel industry in a number of ways, and the industrial strategy is about ensuring that we have uh, a healthy healthy manufacturing industry in this country, but manufacturing industry for the future, providing the high-skilled jobs for the future and the skills for people for the future. Johnny Mercer. Thank you very much. Uh, The Prime Minister will be aware of uh, not only my feelings, but the feelings of Uh, pretty much everyone in this House and the vast majority of this country uh, when it comes to seeing our veterans being dragged through the courts in Northern Ireland to appease political differences. Uh, As Prime Minister, can I ask her what she personally is doing, how she is personally investing of herself in this process to bring to an end something the vast majority of her country find completely abhorrent? I can say to my honourable friend that this is an issue. I'm well aware of the uh, degree of concern that there is about this issue, which is why I have held a number of discussions with the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on this matter. We owe a vast debt of gratitude to the heroism and bravery of the soldiers and police officers who upheld the rule of law and were themselves accountable to it. And that is something that has always set them apart from the terrorists who, during the Troubles, were responsible for the deaths of hundreds of members of the security forces. But as I've made clear, the current system in Northern Ireland is flawed. It isn't working. It isn't working for soldiers, for police officers or for victims, a group, in fact, which includes many soldiers and police officers as well. And so while a number of terrorist murders are, from the Troubles are actively under investigating, investigation by PSNI and other police forces, under the current mechanism for investigating the past, there's a disproportionate focus on former members of the armed forces and the police. We want to ensure that all outstanding deaths in Northern Ireland are investigated in ways that are fair, balanced and proportionate. This is Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since a life changing SMA treatment, Spinraza was rejected by NICE in its first guidance last month, families affected, including that of young San McKee in North Tyneside, have been left heartbroken. 
Will the Prime Minister meet with me and Muscular Dystrophy UK to discuss progress urgently needed with the Managed Access Agreement so that patients can access Bin Raza as soon as possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I say to the that I'm very happy to look at the issue, that the specific issue that she has raised in relation to the decision that's taken by uh, by Nice, and I will ensure that health ministers look into that and uh, have a meeting with her to discuss the details of it. Thank you. Order. Order. Urgent question. Diane Abbott. To ask the Secretary of State for the Home Department if he will make a statement on the National Audit Office's report 